So, good morning. Today, um, we're going to be finishing our discussion on packed beds as well as a discussion on fluidized beds and work a couple examples together as well as in groups on these topics. So I believe last time we talked uh, a fair deal about packed bed flow. So we had discussion on packed beds. And in this discussion, we had said, let me move this over. Net for a given packed bed where we had it within a flow system. We had some P1, some P2. We could quantify the pressure drop. Here's a really fun expression. Actually, it was friction that ended up being discussed. Pressure drop over density because of units. And we had a 150 times u naught times mu L one minus epsilon squared over V squared time of the particle squared density and epsilon cubed plus 1.75 times the velocity squared length one minus epsilon over V time of the particle epsilon cubed. And we had called this the Ergon equation, which describes pressure drop and frictional dissipation in a packed bed. And we also stated that in the Ergon equation, we have two terms, one that constitutes the laminar flow portion of our frictional dissipation and the other, which constitutes the turbulent flow portion of our frictional dissipation. We stated that if the flow is laminar, meaning our Reynolds number was, what was it, less than 10, if I remember correctly, we can rely on the blake cosony equation, which is a simplification of the Ergon equation, which only f requires us to look at the first term and then we also stated if the flow is turbulent where Reynolds number was greater than a thousand we could rely on a friction dissipation focusing on the second term And this was the Burke Plummer equation. So really, really quick recap of that discussion on packed bed flow. There was a little bit more that we discussed, but kind of, you know, giving you the, the spark notes version. Those are the equations of interest to describe our pressure drop and frictional dissipation. And always keeping in mind the units in terms of whether you're looking for pressure drop or whether you're using for frictional dissipation. If you're just wanting pressure drop, so I'll say if looking for delta P, just delta P, we can just don't worry so much about where our densities are. And we'll end up with this expression. So we just put the density back into the expression where appropriate. 
So any questions on our discussion that we had in terms of pressure drop, frictional dissipation, and flow through a packet bed? I do have a question. So Go I was going uh, through the homework the other day and working through it. And on, I, I remember one in particular, maybe two, we were given a uh, column diameter as well as the particle diameter. And I'm just wondering where that will go in the ergon equation and you know similar equations how i would use that that's a good question so that's primarily if provided a flow rate of looking for superficial velocity but in terms of the actual flow parameters the the bed diameter really isn't going to have any sort of influence on either pack bed flow or even fluidization once we talk about it here in a minute. Um, it's really for the purposes of understanding your flow rate, so to speak, through the system. So if I give you a flow and you have the bed diameter, you use that to find your superficial velocity, which you then put into the expression to solve for pressure drop or frictional dissipation in the system. Okay, thank you. Of course. Any other questions? All right, if not, then let's take a look at an example. So in this example, we have water at 30 degrees Celsius being passed through a chromatography column packed with 50 micron spheres. If the column is five millimeters in diameter and the packed length is one meter, Given a superficial velocity of three meters per hour, estimate the pressure drop through the column in pascals or kilopascals. I think kilopascals actually ends up being a little easier. All right, so let's take a look at what we have and what we can do in this problem. So in this problem, we have 50 micron spheres, or the diameter of our particles are five times 10 to the minus fifth meters. The sphericity is gonna be one because they're spheres. The velocity is three meters per hour, which ends up being about 8.33. Let me see what it is, three times 10 to the minus four meters per second. It's water, so we'll say the viscosity is one centipoise, which is 10 to the minus three Pascal seconds. What else do we have? The bed length is one meter. And it's also water, so our density is a thousand kilograms per cubic meter. So looking at our ergon equation, delta P over rho, we can stay that once again, mu naught mu L one minus epsilon over V squared, diameter of the particle square, epsilon cubed plus 1.75 U naught squared L one minus epsilon over, and there's a row here. The time of the particle epsilon cubed. And we'll say that epsilon is 0.5. So what we know is we can solve for this value and it'll give us a units of meter squared per second squared if done correctly. And what I'd like you all to do, I'm gonna shoot you off into breakout rooms, is solve for each of these two terms. And once you get numbers for each of these terms, you know, you can tell me whether this flow is primarily laminar, turbulent, 
or it can be considered transitional flow. So go ahead and do that calculation. I'll give you guys about, uh, say, three, four minutes to work through it. Let's see what we can we can come up with. Still just got a few people hanging out. All right. So how did it go? Did we get an answer for each of these two terms? 
you want to come up with a solution in any groups? I think I have an answer. What is your solution? For the left hand side, I have 199.92. Okay. So 199 or 100.9? 199.92, yeah. Okay. What about the right hand side? I have 116.62. Any groups get similar values? All right, well, the solution should get that these values end up being around 100 meters squared per second squared and about 0 0.097 meters squared per second squared. So I would double check those answers. And since our pressure drop is about a thousand, or excuse me, our density is a thousand kilograms per cubic meter, that gives us a pressure drop of 100 meters squared per second squared plus 0 0.097 meters squared per second squared or 100.097, sorry, excuse me, times 1,000 kilograms per cubic meter, which gives us 100,000. 97 pascals or 100.1 kilopascals. Uh, does that make sense? Would you guys like me to kind of work through it a little bit in more detail? Or do you understand the process of how I am able to obtain my two values? So for this problem, the laminar. Go for it. Um. So could you not calculate the Reynolds number like before you actually do this problem and just do you know either the first term or second term? Can sure. Primarily laminar. Yeah, you can calculate your Reynolds number rho mu naught times the particle over one minus epsilon times mu. Double check my notes. Make sure I'm using the right form. And so that should give you, let's say, a thousand kilograms per cubic meter, 8.33 times 10 to the minus four kilograms per meter second or Pascal seconds. And the time of the particles, about five times 10 to the minus fifth meters per second divided by epsilon. What did I say epsilon was 0.5. So one minus that is just 0.5. And viscosity 10 to the minus three kilograms. Oh, this is, I've screwed this up. I apologize. This is meters per second. This is meters. And this is kilograms per meter second. I said that did not make sense. So we do that calculation. What do we get for our Reynolds? I got 0 0.08, so very small. Yeah, so Reynolds number is 0 0.083, which is much less than 10, which means if you wanted, you could just simply use the Blake Cosony, or you can neglect the second term. And you know, as you see, it would be 100 kilopascals versus 100.1 kilopascals. <laughs> 
which I would argue is within error. So yeah, there's there's you can you can do a Reynolds calculation to figure out if, if a simplification would be in order, or you can just solve the uh, Ergon equation in full. I have a question. Yes. How do you find your epsilon value? You typically don't find it, so to speak, in, in most situations. It would either be provided for you or you would have to do digging in terms of a f the, what packing you have, the packing size and all of that. Um, you could be able to obtain that void fraction based off of like the, the specifications of the packing itself. Because void fractions is a direct, uh, essentially a dimensionless measure of packing density. And so, for example, I, th I believe in your book, Let's see if I can find it really quick. It's a good question. There's a small table with a few different types of packing in it, and it has some information associated with the packing as well as void fractions. You can kind of get an idea of the range of void fractions you can see. It's table 7.2 on page 166. So, so it gives you essentially a small range of relative diameters between particles and and the actual columns themselves, and it gives you for spheres, for cylinders, the expected void fractions in those systems. So that's a very good question. I appreciate you asking that. So that would be table 7.2 on page 166. And it shows you some data of epsilon for spheres and cylinders. And that first column is essentially a ratio of the diameter of the packing to the actual diameter of the tube that it's packed in. And you find that, you know, most packing there, the void fraction is somewhere between about 0.34 and 0.6, which is typically what you find for a lot of a lot of systems. And, and as you see, the smaller the, the packing, the more densely packed it is and the lower the void fraction will be. When you have large, uh, essentially particles, you're gonna have more void space because the packing density is lower. All right, so with that in mind, now let's say I have my packed bed. And I start flowing material through it some superficial velocity, P1, P2. And the question is, what happens when I increase the flow rate? What happens to my pressure drop? I should start there. So if my U naught is increased, what happens to my pressure drop? It'll increase. So the pressure drop will increase. Right. So in general, if I increase my flow rate, I increase my pressure drop. What about the length of the bed? 
What happens to that? I think it will also increase. In general, if I'm looking at this system with the pressure drop increasing, my length won't change at all. So I'll have a constant bed length for a system. However, when U naught gets high enough, the particle experiences a situation where the retaining forces and in this example i'm showing a vertical for so we can kind of imagine it being you know gravity or any sort of force that's keeping it in place and that begins to get overcome by the drag force that's exerted on the particle And when these two forces equal, the particles in the bed begin to fluidize. And so you get this phenomenon of essential weightlessness of the particles and they begin to behave more like a fluid than like a solid. And what we find is in a fluidized bed, increasing the velocity results in negligible change. Now I will say it will increase slightly. However, comparatively to a packed bed, the pressure drop change once you achieve a fluidized bed is very minimal. However, what we find is the bed length will increase with a continued increase in velocity. And so increasing this essentially drag force exerted onto the particles causes a, a, a net upward motion of our particles. And you find that the, you end up with what's known as an expanded bed. And a good illustration of this is this kind of image here where we find originally as the particles exist as a packed bed, we have a static bed increasing the pressure, isn't gonna do anything in terms of changing the bed length. And then as it fluidizes, we start to see that weightlessness that happens and the bed exists as an expanded bed, increasing the velocity, you can notice that you end up with uh, a pretty large bed. And so what you find is that pressure depth doesn't change because you're essentially moving the particles out around with an increase of velocity. And so the void fraction is decreasing, which is uh, essentially neglecting any expected changes that you should see in, in frictional dissipation um, associated with the particles in the flow. However, if you increase the velocity even further too much, you end up with a, an essentially a washout situation. And then instead of having a fluidized bed, you're essentially just washing out your particles. Another uh, illustration of this is shown in this figure here, where if you see essentially a dimensionalized velocity as a function of a dimensionalized pressure drop, when we have a packed bed, increasing the velocity increases the pressure drop as well as having that static bed length. This is the other axis, unfortunately, I think it got cut off. Once you get essentially the fluidization point, the pressure change becomes very minimal, and then you start to see the expansion 
of the bed with a further increase in our velocity. Any questions on that phenomenon as well as the discussion as it relates to pressure drop, bed length, and velocity? I have a question. Yes. So you said the fluidization of the bed. Does that mean if we turn the fluid flow off, the bed would go back to its original form? Yes. If you want, this is actually related to um, your synthesis assignment. I'm guessing a lot of you haven't even seen it yet. But I think it's, it's, there's, there's fun things that you can do with fluidized beds. And so let's see. How many, I'm sure most of you have heard of Mark Rober, is that correct? Yes or no? Yeah, isn't he like the YouTuber that makes cool videos? It's like yeah. crazy inventions. Yeah, he makes crazy inventions. <laughs> and I think it's fun on a lot of what he does. And so one of the things that, here, I can show computer sound now that I know how to do it. Uh, I think it was like towards the end of 2017. Yeah, he made this video that d actually discusses a lot of essentially fluidized bed systems. And what he ended up doing was filling a hot tub of sand and turning it into a fluidized bed. And so you Filled to the see, brim with solid sand. Whenever he turns on the airflow, it becomes a fluidized bed. But when you turn it off, it, it instantly goes back to what you expect in terms of sand properties. And so I'll see if I can find a good point in the video where he makes a small version here with just this plastic tub and some fine sand. The top surface is nearly frictionless. It's like an air hockey table. And then when you cut off the air, it freezes everything exactly where it's at. So it's a really good example and illustration of fluidized beds and how getting the air essentially your fluid velocity at such the point that you can fluidize your particles and how quickly and instantly it can change properties into a fluid-like state. Hopefully that answers your question, Aaron, in a, in a creative manner. Um, it's, it's interesting because, you know, it, it's desired because within that fluidized state, you, you can imagine in, in like reaction systems and things, you have really good mixing and the, the mass transport that you can experience in those systems is much greater than what you would expect um, in a packed bed. And so that's why in a lot of systems, as it relates to process engineering, a fluidized bed is, is advantageous. So any other questions? So yeah, so you're, your synthesis assignment this week is related to doing some calculations around the work he did with a fluidized hot tub. Exciting. So jumping back to our notes, you know, with these concepts of fluidized beds in mind, we can solve for a, a number of things as it relates to fluidized bed. Um, the, one of the most important things that we also want, that we're notice, interested in is essentially the fluid velocity at our fluidization point, or you know what's known as the minimum 
And so this is essentially the velocity such that above it, you, you exist as a fluidized bed below it, it's a packed bed. And this is essentially the point at which you just start to balance out those forces between what you see in a packed bed and what you see for a fluid ice bed. And so in this case, it is derived from Ergon equation as well as a, um, a momentum balance. I'm gonna spare you the derivation. And so what you know what you see here is essentially you know that drag force pressure dissip frictional dissipation and here what we have is essentially buoyancy and, and gravitational influences Right, and so remember going back to our our system, you know, falling or moving up under gravity, the hot air balloon problem, this is exactly the same setup that we have for that momentum balance. We have the relative gravity force correcting for buoyancy, which is why you see the, the relative densities. And this is gonna be the density of the fluid. This is gonna be the density of the fluid. This rho sub p is the density of the particle. And so essentially, once you get the right velocity, the Dirac force equals this relative gravitational buoyancy force. And at that point, you become a fluidized bend. One thing you'll notice, though, is that in a lot of these systems, if you're interested in solving for a fluidized bed, what we end up with is a number times velocity plus a number times velocity squared equals a number. And what this means is when we go to solve for our velocity, we often end up with is, you know, some number times velocity squared plus another number times velocity plus another number equals zero. What this means is you end up with a quadratic equation to solve. And in the end, you should end up with two roots. One of them, only one should make sense in terms of your solution for minimum fluidization velocity. So I'll say pick the root that makes sense. So one other thing that we, we often consider is the bed height after fluidization. Where this height is related to the length at fluidization times one minus the void fraction at fluidization minus the current fluidization. So C E sub M and L sub M are values at u sub m or the minimum fluidization. Point. <laughs> 
So there's a couple others in terms of equations that I'll let you discover through homework, but these are definitely the, the two that I usually like to highlight. And I think the best way to look at these kinds of things is to work some examples. So let's take a look at one more example, which is shown here. So for this one, we have catalyst pellets about 0.2 inches in diameter are fluidized with 75,000 pounds per hour of air at one atmosphere and 75 degrees in a vertical vessel. If the density of the particles are 60 pounds per cubic feet with a sphericity of 0.6, what is the vessel diameter? If the airflow weight is sufficient to fluidize the pellets given the following of a void fraction of 0.45 for our system and a fluid viscosity of 8.8 .8 times 10 to the minus six. All right, so let's take a look at this problem. So the pellets are 0.2 inches in diameter, which gives us a very small value in feet, or 0 0.0167 feet. The mass flow rate of air was 75,000 pounds per hour. Pressure is one atmosphere. And the temperature is 75 degrees. The particle density is approximately 60 pounds per cubic foot with a sphericity of 0.6. And I stated that epsilon was 0.45 and the viscosity was 8.8 .8 times 10 to the minus 6 pounds per uh oh feet second and so let's take a look at our expression and see what we need so for a fluidized bed, our minimum fluidization velocity. Is approximately 150 times mu times u naught times one minus epsilon divided by our sphericity squared times the diameter of the particle squared times epsilon cubed plus 1.75 times our density times our velocity squared divided by sphericity times our diameter of our particle times epsilon cubed once again. And that equals gravity times the relative density of the particle 
and the fluid. So it looks like we should have everything except for the density of the air. We can solve for the density of the air by P M over R T. We have one atmosphere or 14.7 PSI. The molecular weight of air is 29 pounds per pound mole. R in this case would be 10.73 PSI cubic feet per pound mole degree R. And we have 75 degrees Fahrenheit, which in Rankin is approximately 535 degrees. which gives us a density of approximately 0 0.074 pound mass per cubic feet. So with this in mind, we can solve for each of these terms in our expression. Let's start with the first term. So we have 150 times the viscosity of 8.8 .8 times 10 to the minus, what was it? Six pounds per feet second times one minus epsilon or one minus 0.45, which let's simplify that as just 0.55 divided by our sphericity squared or 0.6 squared times the diameter of our particles, which we found to be 0.0167 feet. Squared times our epsilon cubed or 0.45 cubed times U sub M. And I'll make this M for the minimum fluidization velocity. So what does this equal? All right, because once again, we're looking for number times u sub m. I believe I ended up with If I want to check units, I can. Let's see, I've got pounds on the top, feet cubed, and second on the bottom. Five pounds per feet cubed seconds. Which, when I combine these, this whole term's units is pounds per feet squared, second squared. Just keep that in mind for when I look at each other term. Now let's look at the second term in our equation. So I have 1.75 times the density of our fluid, which we found was 0 0.074 pounds per cubic feet, divided by sphericity, or 0.6, our diameter of our particle, 0.0167 feet, times our void fraction cubed, times u sub m, 
squared. So if I look at this term, I have 79, excuse me, 1.75. I ended up with 137.8 times u m squared. If I want to check my units on this one, I end up with pounds per feet to the fourth, which if I multiply that times feet squared per second squared, I end up with pounds, excuse me, per feet squared, second squared. So the units match up between these two terms. Then for our last term, I simply have gravity or 32.2 feet per second squared times the relative density or 60 pound per feet cubed minus 0 0.074 pound mass per cube cubed. And this one I end up with 1,930 with units of pound mass per feet squared, second squared. So for each of these terms, my units match up. And so if I were to bring this over and reorganize, I can write the expression that I have for my minimum fluidization velocity. as 137.8 times um squared plus 79.35 times u sub m minus 1930 equals zero. So if I solve this quadratic equation, I get two solutions. One is negative 4.04 .04, and the second is 3.47. So once again, as I said, one should make sense. So our solution should be 3.47 meters per second for our minimum fluidization velocity. Oh, it's feet per second, excuse me, units. So we now know our minimum fluidization velocity, and we also know our mass flow rate, which was provided initially as, what? Got to go way back to the beginning, 75,000 pounds per hour. So how can we solve for the vessel diameter now that we know our minimum fluidization velocity and our mass flow rate? You could use the density to convert to volumetric flow rate and then divide by velocity to get area and then from there. All right, so if we know that our density is 0.074 pound mass per cubic feet, then our volumetric flow rate is simply our mass flow rate divided by that density, or 75,000 pounds per hour divided by the density 0.07 pound mass per cubic feet. 
I'll also take this and make it into seconds. One hour is 3,600 seconds. And so that gives us a value. of approximately 281.5 cubic feet per second. And so if I know that my volumetric flow rate is my velocity times my area, therefore my area equals my volumetric flow rate over my velocity. I don't know why this is getting a little messy which means I have 281.5 cubic feet per second divided by my velocity, which we found to be 3.47 feet per second. And I get 81.1 one three feet squared. And with that in mind, knowing area is equal to pi d squared over four. That means my diameter is four times my area over pi square root. So the square root of four times 81.13 feet squared over pi is my diameter. And if I solve for that, let's see what I get. About 10.16 feet for my diameter of my column. Any questions on that example? So we don't use the particle density, we use the fluidization density. So whatever more you have of, that's the density we're gonna use. For which part? Whenever you find your volumetric flow rate, you divided by the sand density. No, no, I divided by the fluid density, which was 0.074. The, the particle density was 60. The fluid density, okay. And I get the necessary diameter of 10.16 feet. All right, so we have enough time, I think, for one more example. So, so let's take a look. And so for this example, I see tests for a new catalyst in a 10 by 50 centimeter column showing a minimum fluidization velocity of 6.55 millimeters per second when using air at 25 degrees in one atmosphere. So the question asks, predict UM for a catalyst in a larger reactor that's 0.8 meters in diameter and two meters tall. Looking, assuming a new gas being chlorine, at 30 degrees Celsius and five atmospheres. So this one's uh, definitely a little trickier. I'll give you guys a, a few seconds to write it down. Okay. 
So let's take a look at this and see what we can come up with. All right, so what do we know? We have two columns that we're looking at. The original is 10 centimeters in diameter by 50 centimeters in height. And a scaled up version that is 0.8 meters or 80 centimeters. I don't know why they didn't just stick to the same units and two meters tall. I'll make it 0.8 just to be consistent. So this original used air at 25 C and one atmosphere. This new system is looking at chlorine at 300 degrees C and five atmospheres. So I can, what I can tell you is that for this air system, the density is 1.21 kilograms per cubic meter, and the viscosity is approximately 1.79 times 10 to the minus fifth kilograms per meter second. And for chlorine, the density is approximately 7.54 kilograms per cubic meter with a viscosity of 2.6 times 10 to the minus fifth kilograms per meter second. And we said this fluidization velocity was 6.5 millimeters per second. And what we're looking for is UM using the same catalyst. So, what I'm gonna do, instead of just jumping in immediately, I'm gonna shoot you guys into some breakout rooms. I'm gonna give you about five-ish minutes, five, probably six minutes actually, this one's a little weird. But I will give you hints. And I will say, look at figure 712 in the book and equation What's the equation number? 751. They will kind of steer you in terms of what you need to do. This is a little harder, so. I'll see what you guys can come up with and then we'll talk about it as a class before we, we call it for the day. <laughs> 
All right. So how did it go? Did you guys get some thoughts? We're still kind of a little lost on this one. <clears throat> I have a question. Yes. If air is our fluid, and on figure 7.12, it says the void is 0.5. So how is that constant? Why doesn't that change depending on, you know, the size of the particle? It can and it will. But the, what if the figure is, is showing normalized data for a given void fraction. So you can artificially manipulate what you expect to see for particles of a different size, given a constant void fraction, if that makes sense. It's essentially looking at a study of manipulating particle size, um, given air as the constraint and identifying how does the minimum fluidization velocity work for particles of different sizes and densities. If that makes sense. And so this one's a little tricky because there's the calculation is minimal. It's the analysis and application of the system that is critical. So one thing we can consider is If we were to solve for the Reynolds number, of this system, let's say our, our void fraction is 0.5, similar to that data. What did we say for the, the density? We had 1.21 kilograms per cubic meter. Our velocity was really small at this initial system. We had 6.5 times 10 to the minus three meters per second. The diameter of the particle we didn't have, but we could estimate it using figure 12. So for that fluidization velocity of about 6.5 millimeters per second, we can get a particle diameter somewhere between 70 and 100 microns. So if I were to use the average of that, let's say 85 microns, or 85 times 10 to the minus six meters, 0.5. And the viscosity we had was 1.79 times 10 to the minus fifth kilograms per meter second. What should we get for our Reynolds? And this is just to kind of get an idea and ballpark of this value. I got a pretty small number, about 0 0.007, which tells me the system is highly laminar. And so if I'm looking at my expression for fluidization velocity, I see that the two terms that I'm looking at in that left-hand side they correlate to a laminar and a turbulent regime. And I pointed you to 6751 because if you read the text there, it says for very small particles, we can only have to consider the laminar flow term, which means we can simplify and look at our minimum fluidization velocity 
being approximated by this form of the expression. And if I were to change my system from air to chlorine and do a scale up, this would be the same. Because if I'm looking at the same particles, I'm looking at the same void fraction, the same sphericity, and the same diameter of the particles. So I only have to consider is how do the terms in this expression change when looking at essentially scaling up my system as well as changing my fluid. Now I can argue that the density of my particles minus air versus the density of the particles minus chlorine, that's gonna be a negligible change. Primarily because the density of the particles in the system is gonna dominate, it's a solid particle. So looking at the difference between the solid and these two different gases, I'm still gonna get about the same value. So the only thing that's really gonna change in the system is the viscosity term in terms of what I should expect to see by changing my minimum, um, in terms of the change of my minimum fluidization velocity. And so to solve for this new minimum fluidization velocity, I just have to look at the relative, in, relative viscosity rates. And so all you really need to say is to find the new one, I have 6.5 millimeters per second times viscosity one, which was what? 0.0179, and that's, I can just put it in centipoise and 0.026 here. And I find that that minimum fluidization velocity decreases slightly to 4.5 millimeters per second. So this one was a little different because it's more looking at the expressions and what they mean and how they can be applied in the situation of essentially a fluidized bed scale up. So we're about out of time. Are there any last minute questions or things that I can kind of clear up uh, before I let you all go to, to work on homework as well as do uh, your other things in the day? We need to have office hours after this. Yeah, I'll jump in from 11 to noon today. I'll be busy this afternoon, but I will uh, make myself available this, this morning, right after class. Yeah, I just got a quick question. Uh, no, no problem. This. All right, if that's it, thanks guys for listening. Um, I hope you all enjoyed today, and I hope you all have a great rest of your day and weekend. Um, mm -hmm. All right. Dr. Lopez.